Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I know most people in the room. I'm Mike Clagg. I'm the dean. I want to thank you for coming to this dean's lecture. And, and we do this, these lectures, for uh, people who are appointed or promoted to the rank of professor. And as I always say, that's a decision that's not made by me or by the uh, A&P committee or the advisory board. In a sense, it's really made by peers around the world who we write to and ask their opinion and they evaluate uh, the candidate's work and, and then uh, give us the data to decide, to make, to sort of effectuate the decision. And in, in, in Janice's uh, case, the letters were some of the strongest and most outstanding letters that we've ever seen. So it was, it was, it was a, a joy uh, to read them at the advisory board. So, so what I usually do now is I introduce the candidate uh, to people who know the candidate much better than I know the person. So, but I'm, I'm going to do that because it's my duty. And uh, so, so Janice, as many of you know, uh, got her BS degree cum laude from Davidson College and then went to UNC uh, in Chapel Hill to get her PhD in cell developmental and molecular biology. And she did postdocs at the Scripps Research Institute and then uh, a longer postdoc at Penn. And after that, she came here to our school, I think in 97, uh, to, uh, is it 97? Yeah. And to, uh, to what was then the Department of Population Dynamics right before reproductive biology moved into BMB. And it was a great day for our school when, when, when she decided to come here. And reading your CV, I, I saw that you spent time at the, at the MBL in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, where I used to work. You know, I worked there for uh, two years. And then um, and in coming here, she's, since coming here, she's been very successful, has had uh, uh, NIH support since she arrived. Now, you have some sense of what she's going to talk about and, and sort of the broad range of things that she's interested in. And it's, uh, she's really remarkable in that having, uh, you know, in trying to understand how, uh, how the, uh, the, the ovum gets the right amount of DNA and how, how the regulation of, of fertilization and other things. She's also been involved as, uh, in our educational efforts as an incredible teacher and, and someone who clearly is passionate about her students and they're equally passionate about her. Uh, she's one of the major forces uh, in the department for the growth of the, the, the master's degree there and, and received rave reviews from, from the students in, in the degree program. Um, she's also, I think, going to talk about, uh, about her commitment to service learning. And, and I see Mindy Levin here from Source, and I, I, I sense I have some idea of the things that you're going to talk about. Uh, I, I met Janice uh, early in my tenure as dean, uh, and, and then um, she was one of those rare faculties. When I would go elsewhere, people would talk to me about her and about uh, how fortunate we are to have her on the faculty. She's won a number of awards. Uh, she won the Young Andrologist Award in 2006 from the American Society of Andrology for significant contributions to the field of andrology for a person, a, a young person. Uh, and she, um, she was uh, inducted into the Delta Omega Honorary Society in 2013. She serves on a number of review committees, NIH and other review committees, and has chaired uh, the Gordon Conferences uh, on Fertilization and Activation Development, the 2012 meeting of the American Society of Andrology, and the 2013 meeting of the Society for Reproduction. In 2014 to 2015, she was a Source Faculty uh, Fellow, and this is a special program that was funded by, by the President of the University to, uh, to encourage service learning and develop new ways and innovative ways for our students and faculty to learn through service. Um, she is uh, also um, participating in the Johns Hopkins Medicine Leadership Program. She's a great colleague uh, and a highly respected colleague, and we're so happy that you're here uh, and we're benefiting from your talent. So please join me in welcoming Janice Evans. Okay. If people can hear me okay? All right, excellent. I, I am want to roam around, so I insisted on the lavalier. <laughs> well, thank you. It is really cool to see so many faces here and from so many different facets of my life here at the Bloomberg School. 
And I'm, I'm truly touched that you all have come. It's, you know, I, I have that mortal fear, right? What happens if you throw a dean's lecture and nobody comes, you know? Um, so, so that's my starting point you is. the wine early. <laughs> <laughs> and well, and I, I, I warned Mike, I'll warn everybody else. Like, uh, so the, the, I, I direct our master's program, as some of you know. And they unfortunately have an exam right now. But I did tell them, if you want to come to the reception, do, do a little shout out. And they'll be post-exam, so. Yay and sorry. Um, <laughs> but my, so my first slide is a big thank you. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, you know, thank you, Mike, for having me here and all the deans. Your jobs are not easy and often, I can only surmise, pretty thankless. So my first big thank you is to you guys because you are part of what makes this a great place to be and make me so grateful to be here. And I'm also starting out with a couple other acknowledgments. I'm thanking the many different people who have been in my lab because, of course, as most of you know, even though I love, love, love the lab, love research, I'm, I'm not in the lab as much as I want to be, and I am indebted to these folks who are in the lab um, uh, and make it possible for me to um, be married to my laptop and, and also to teach. And also, this is an opportunity for me to do a shout out. Um, let me see if I can get my cursor working. I have a PhD student right here, Lauren McGinnis, who will be defending her dissertation on Monday. So our talks are right here, back to back. Um, I will present a tiny bit of science today. But for those of you that really want to hear a lot of what the Evans Lab is all about and what my research program is so lucky to benefit from, come here, Lauren, because you know, she'll, she'll have a great, great story to tell um, on Monday. So another thing I've said about doing this dean's lecture is it's a little bit like a doctoral dissertation on steroids. I mean, I remember the day I defended my dissertation, probably many of you remember that day. And it's a big day. And, and this feels even bigger, because there, there's, there's so much more. And so, in representing the body of work from these many wonderful people that are on this slide, I also think back and reflect and have to do a thanks to mom and dad. And, and this is a little unfair because here I am playing on your sympathy strings like, oh gosh, she's thanking her mom and dad. How could we not be rooting for her in this talk, right? But also I'm showing mom and dad here because they are a bit of a foundation for, for what I'll be talking about. So my dad over on the right hand side of the slide is an academician. I'm a professor's brat, grew up in Chapel Hill. Um, and I definitely get that hardcore analytical side of my brain, the side that actually loves to stare at Excel spreadsheets and go through data and massage it from him. He's a quantitative methods kind of guy. And also, he's been very invested in the University of North Carolina from a service standpoint. And I think I bring that here. It's like, how can I not be a member of an academic community and do service? But some of the service also comes from mom over on the left-hand side. So she's been very active um, in the community. And this will be a theme that I hit towards the end of my talk, talking about community involvement. And just one fun thing, she's done many amazing things. She was on the town council in my hometown. But among the things she's done um, since that time as a community activist, all the fire trucks in Chapel Hill, North Carolina are Carolina blue. And that is my mom's doing. And that's the fire truck down there. So thank you, Mom and Dad, for getting me here. And now, I'll kick us off. I hope this slide projects fairly well. So many of you probably recognize what we're looking at. There are two different pregnancy <laughs> tests with two different results. And so I'd like everyone to kind of spend just a little second looking at those and, and kind of do a little gut check. Check in with your gut reaction as you, know, as you look at these. So the story I often tell <clears throat> to my first term class, Fundamentals of Reproductive Biology, is everyone at some point in their life has probably had to you know, think about one of these. And sometimes you might be thinking about the result on the left and hoping for the result on the left. Or at a different point in your life, actually, you might be thinking about the result on the right and hoping very much for that. And, and that's where reproductive biology and reproduction in general fits in the big scheme with health and public health, is that pretty much everyone at some point in their life has thought very, very hard about their reproductive destiny, shall we say. And even at different points in your life, you know, earlier stage, you're probably hoping for that result on the left or your partner to have that result on the left. And then later on in life, you're thinking much more about that result that's there on the right. 
And so I think in many ways, you know, reproduction really fits in in a big way with, with what we do here. And that'll be my starting theme for what I talk about here. And indeed, part of what drew me to reproductive <coughs> biology was an interest in contraceptive development. This even started in high school. I was looking around and saw many wonderful young women getting pregnant, having to take a leave of absence from high school, delaying their graduation. And meanwhile, I'm also sitting in health classes and they're describing these techniques and the biologist in me is going, that's it? This is, this is all we have? You know, and, and, and sadly, even that list of contraceptives has not changed a whole lot from when I learned it in health class and now I teach it myself in Fundamentals of Reproductive Biology. But nonetheless, this was a big part of what drew me um, into this area and indeed I think helped set the stage for me you know, finding this wonderful home in the Bloomberg School of Public Health because there are many people here who think about this in the same way I do. One other aspect of public health relevance where reproduction fits in, and I show this also to my first term students, is this International Declaration of Health Rights. So everyone knows we're celebrating our centennial in the School of Public Health right now. And actually on the 75th anniversary of the school is when this document was drafted. And so these are two snippets from this document, the International Declaration of Health Rights, that I think really underscore where reproduction fits in. And one very simple example is health is more than the absence of disease. And, and reproduction and being able to reproduce on your own terms at times that you want are, is a big, big part of that. And then obviously the second bulleted point, talking about the role of women and their welfare must be recognized and addressed. Obviously a huge aspect of where reproductive health fits in is with women's health. And so, I, I, again, this is another thing that makes me feel very, very lucky, very fortunate, and very at home as a basic scientist studying reproduction in the School of Public Health. But then even though this was something that drew me to the field initially, once I started going through undergrad into graduate school, there are other aspects of reproduction that are just as important. And I'll use my next couple slides to illustrate where these things fit in. <clears throat> So to illustrate a couple other um, very well-known um, health conditions, Alzheimer's disease, you know, I have here a couple different options here. This is where I make my classes do a little audience participation. Anybody want to take a gander as to the incidence of Alzheimer's disease in the US? I should have gotten going with poll everywhere to let you guys do it anonymously, but I couldn't get the poll ev app working. So it's like, and most of you would probably, anyone who takes a multiple choice exam, you know, would pick the answer right in the middle. So very close to 2%. How about heart attacks? Any guesses for that? How many heart attacks per year in the US? High end, low end. This one's on the relatively low end, you might be surprised. So here I'm using the denominator, um, the total number of Americans. Um, and when you put it in that context, we're talking about relatively few, so not, not to diminish it as a major health um, issue, but nonetheless, not a big robust number. And you can probably guess where this is going. Next, I'm going to talk about reproduction. <clears throat> and so here, thinking about US women having trouble either getting pregnant initially or carrying a pregnancy the term. If you're getting the ilk of my little message here, we're going to be looking at the lower part of the slide. Um, and so indeed, um, when you think about all females in the US, so that's an estimate based on half the US population, it's very close to 5%. But that's not even adjusting the denominator for the number of women in reproductive age, which would obviously be a subset of this. So this issue of infertility or subfertility is a growing issue, and I will do a shout out to Chelsea Polis, who gave a talk earlier today and also highlighted this in, in your very own way. And I think this, yeah, it's like we were in sync. <laughs> and, and so in showing a map of global fertility, um, certainly um, the, you see bright colors here. So to orient you in this graph, um, you go from the lavender to the more intense kind of purplish reddish and the more purplish reddish um, is going to more than six children born to a woman over her lifetime. And you know, definitely you can see that there are quite, quite, quite a number of countries with fairly striking bright colors. But if we look at similar data for infertility, and here it's a shade of green, but the more intense the green, we're looking at the percentage of women in reproductive age, 20 to 44, who are unable to achieve a live birth after five years of training. That's five times longer than the American Medical Association's definition of infertility. Um, 
This is a striking number of women unable to conceive after a fairly significant chunk of time of living naturally without using contraception. And I'm using this to underscore how both sides of this image, looking at the non-pregnant and pregnant <coughs> um, pregnancy tests, both are really important for health and well-being and by definition for public health. So I've got my talk broken into two parts. And these are addressing, as I say, the duality of life as a Bloomberg School of Public Health faculty member. Unscrambling eggs, that's referring to our research, as Mike alluded to, trying to understand the nuts and bolts of basically what makes eggs tick. So I'm basically trained as a cell biologist. And the, eggs, the cells that we study are some of the most famous. Almost everyone has heard of eggs and sperm, which makes us very lucky. The other part of my talk, which I'll get to in a bit, it will be thinking about the other side of life as a faculty member, and that's the teaching side. As Nancy alluded to, it's something I'm just as passionate about as the research. So the research side, I'll kick us off. I've got a subtitle here. We'll be talking about the mechanics, so the mechanical biology of oocytes. And another way to put this, how do you like your eggs, hard or soft? And I'll give away a little bit of the answer right up front. It kind of depends on where the egg is in its life cycle. And there's definitely a sort of Goldilocks principle here. An egg can be too hard or too soft. And that's some of the biology that we've been studying the last few years. So to set the stage, to give everyone an appreciation of the cells that we're talking about and where they come from, um, this image of uh, the upper left is showing the female reproductive tract. The ovaries are the whitish structures um, uh, descending down from the fallopian tube or the oviduct. And that's what's zoomed in on, um, on the right-hand side of this image. And what I want you to notice are these little structures that are called follicles. Those are the compartments within which the oocytes are developing. And you can see that the follicles start in a very small state known as primordial follicles, progress through these growth stages known as primary <laughs> follicles, and then get to the point where they've got a fully developed oocyte that then will be released from the ovary, and then the oocyte goes out into the oviduct, that's the reddish structure that you see in the zoom in, and that's where fertilization occurs. So my next slide is a different schematic looking at the ovary and a zoom in on the ovarian follicle, again, these compartments where the oocyte develops. And so here, this illustrates very nicely what happens to the oocyte. I'll also highlight the brownish colored cells that are in here. These are somatic cells that are essentially nurse cells that support the, develop, the development of the oocyte through these stages of follicle development known as folliculogenesis going hand in hand with oocyte development or oogenesis, leading to the point again where the oocyte is released from the ovarian follicle and travels out to the oviduct where fertilization occurs. The next slide will be looking at the oocyte all by itself and its progression through the meiotic divisions. The meiotic divisions on the female side of things are uniquely different from what you classically see in a textbook with one cell at the top and then two and then four. The oocyte progresses through meiosis in a very staggered fashion and also undergoes its cell divisions in a very asymmetric manner. So you aren't going to end up with those four little cells down at the bottom if you remember your classic textbook images of meiosis. So here I'll just illustrate the time course of this so you can appreciate a little bit what the oocyte is going through in these transitions through meiosis. So in terms of when meiosis starts with the very first step of DNA synthesis, DNA synthesis actually occurs with oocytes in their ovarian follicles in a female fetus, in an unborn baby girl. So her oocytes are already set aside in fetal gonads, in fetal ovaries, and they've already done the very first stage of meiosis, and they arrest in the very first stage of meiosis known as prophase. And that's why I have labeled up at the top of the slide PRO1. That's short for prophase 1. Then in response to gonadotropin signals um, that, that trigger the, um, this meiotic maturation process, which we call the oocyte to egg transition, that triggers the oocyte to go through its first meiotic division, illustrated here. And here I'll highlight the very asymmetric cell division, if you can see my cursor right there. And for people here in the room who like a bright pointer, I'm, doing, I'm highlighting it there. So this is a very small daughter cell known as a polar body 
that's produced by virtue of this very uneven, this very asymmetric cell division. So the cell actually then will arrest halfway into meiosis II, and this is a state known as metaphase II, abbreviated MET2 up at the top of the slide. And this is where the egg will be arrested until a sperm comes along and fertilizes it, and then in turn um, activates the egg. The process is indeed known as egg activation. And this culminates as the egg to embryo transition, the initiation of embryogenesis. So now you've met the oocyte. Let me do a little bit of background on mechanobiology, because this will be what I'll be talking about in terms of the biology in the oocytes that we're talking about. So I just have two slides to introduce this. Here we're looking at your typical squished down somatic cell um, in a tissue or in culture. And probably everyone in the audience appreciates that there are some standard signals that all our cells are receiving. They could be ions moving in and out through ion channels. Um, they can be a variety of different chemical ligands illustrated here binding to a cell surface receptor. These can include growth factors, chemokines, cytokines, you name it. Um, as well as cell adhesion itself, the connection of a cell to um, its neighboring cells is also part of a signal to a cell. But indeed, in addition to these mechanical signals, uh, excuse, excuse me, these biochemical signals, there are mechanical signals. And these are pretty easy to conceptualize if you think about it. Either the pushing in on a cell or the cell pushing out or feeling forces pulling on it. And so these are just as important as the biochemical signals that a cell is receiving. And one classic example are ion channels that are activated by what's called stretch or stretch activated channels or some other comparable mechanical stimulus that gets channels such as this one here to open and close in response to those mechanical forces. So one now, one area I'd like you to zoom into on the cell here is this region just underlying the plasma membrane that I have um, labeled in gray and identified as the cell cortex. We're going to zoom in on that on the next slide. The cell cortex, primarily focusing on the actin cytoskeleton, is, is made up these, of these uh, proteins that make these filamentous structures. Actin filaments are shown in orange. Myosin, um, which is a, a contractile protein, is shown in blue. And then you have additional proteins that support this jungle gym of proteins, this network. In brown are anchoring proteins that um, anchor these pro uh, these, this meshwork to the plasma membrane. And then also green proteins, these actin crosslinkers that hold these in place. And so here also is a place for me to do a shout out to the person who drew this beautiful image. This is cour courtesy of Doug Robinson, who's been our collaborator over in the School of Medicine in the Department of Cell Biology. And he's one who really kicked things off really nicely. Here I'll do a shout out to Susan Michaelis in the audience, because I think actually we were trying to get you to be on a student's committee. And you were super duper busy, and you said, you know what, you should get Doug. You know, one of the proteins that you're studying is, is kind of like one that Doug Robinson is studying. So even though I, you know, you're wonderful, that was one of the best things that happened in my career. Well, a wonderful little bit of Hopkins serendipity because we got together with Doug. He started working with us as part of um, this student's dissertation committee. And it was with him that we started doing these studies of the mechanics of the oocyte. So I'll show you the assay that we're doing and, and ask you to picture it in this way. So imagine I've given you a balloon and also a straw. And actually, I've given you two different balloons. One is really, really well inflated. One is only partially inflated. It's really a very flaccid balloon. And you're going to take that straw, put it against the surface of the balloon, and suck on it. So obviously, the balloon that's really well inflated, you're going to have to like cross your eyes and suck really hard to get that balloon to deform, to get a little bit of that balloon to suck into that straw. If it's a flaccid balloon, very poorly inflated, you're going to have a hard, you know, you're going to have an easy time sucking that balloon into the straw. That, in essence, are the assays that we do in collaboration with Doug Robinson. So up top, the upper right image is a um, video micrograph of this process. Instead of a straw, we've got a glass pipette. Instead of a balloon, we have a mouse oocyte here. And aspiration pressure is being applied towards the right-hand side of the room. And if you look closely at the video or at the still shots down at the bottom, you can see that a little piece of that cell is being sucked into this pipette. 
And if you can watch right here, you might be able to see it happen as the, as the um, video loops. And so based on how hard you're aspirating, how hard you're sucking on that glass pipette, and the geometry of that little tether that sucked into the oocyte, by a little bit of relatively simple math, no calculus, just good, nice, simple algebra, we can calculate a measurement that reflects how rigid or how soft these cells are. And so in these studies, I'll just give you a taste of some of the data that we've gotten with a couple little take-home messages. Um, as the oocyte progresses through meiosis, we see incredibly dramatic changes in this measurement known as cortical tension or effective tension. So the schematic diagram is the same as what I've shown you, starting with that oocyte that's been arrested at prophase one since the oocyte entered that stage of meiosis before birth. Progression through what's known as germinal vesicle breakdown. Um, for cell cycle people, that's the exact same thing as nuclear envelope breakdown. And then progressing through the first meiotic division to this metaphase two arrest, and then completing meiosis with fertilization. Down in the lower graph, I've got those same stages labeled on the x-axis, and the y-axis are the measurements of effective tension in nanometers per micron. And one take-home message are these prophase one oocytes. Let me point at this little bar right here. Um, so the prophase one oocytes shown here are among the most rigid cells that have ever been studied. Um, so these are basically little rocks. It's like taking a straw and putting it on a baseball and trying to suck on it. And as you can see, cortical tension changes dramatically with this progression through meiosis. And this is fairly significant. One would have not necessarily guessed this, looking at this deceptively round, not seeming to change a whole lot from the outside kind of cell. And yet when we do these measurements, um, we can pick up on these kinds of subtleties that otherwise we wouldn't have noticed. One other little piece of data, so we've got um, a metaphase two egg being aspirated over on the right-hand side, graph from prophase one oocytes over on the left-hand side, and probably the video is the most interesting. If you watch the aspiration process, the sucking of that oocyte into this pipette in this case, you can see that it gets slurped in very, very rapidly, and a huge piece of that cell gets sucked into the pipette. What that means is this is a relatively soft cell. And so this, this is a metaphase II egg that's been treated with a drug that disrupts the actin cytoskeleton. And so we've done these kinds of experiments to target certain molecules of interest, actin being a biggie in this case, and demonstrating that when we disrupt the function of these particular proteins, uh, these provide us with data for um, the molecular players that are involved in this process of um, cortical tension. So with that, I'll go beyond just the basics of oocyte biology and put it in context with a real world example that definitely has reproductive success consequences. And these are post-ovulatory aged eggs. So here again, I'm showing you the timeline of oocyte development going from the oocyte growing in the follicles back in the ovary to when that oocyte is ovulated and then arrives out in the oviduct. So an, an, an egg, as we call it at that stage, could be fertilized right away if sperm are there, or it might be sitting around for a while. And if it's sitting around for a while, that's the phenomenon known as post-ovulatory aging. And with post-ovulatory aging, there are lots of data, including some data generated by faculty here at the School of Public Health from humans, other people who have done studies in animals, that correlate post-ovulatory aging with poor reproductive outcomes. So if we're talking about women, it could be a failure to conceive, it could be embryo loss. If we're talking about mice, we're talking about either smaller litters or maybe no litters at all. And from the human standpoint, this is why ovulation prediction kits exist, so that a woman can uh, come, come to a close estimate of when her fertile period is, if you notice the little tagline from the website here, take the guesswork out of getting pregnant naturally. And it's a way to identify the time when an oocyte is at its prime and most likely to contribute to successful fertilization. And so here are some of those same cortical tension data um, we are here doing measurements now of what we call young eggs. Young eggs are retrieved from our mice that have been injected with the ovulation-inducing hormone LH. The young eggs are collected at a relatively early point at their prime of 13 hours after the mice are induced to ovulate. 
And the aged eggs are collected at a much later time point, 22 hours after that ovulation-inducing hormone. And so the aged eggs are the open bars. Please compare them to the gray bars. And you can see for these two different regions of the egg that I'm not spending time telling you about, um, that cortical tension is dramatically reduced in an egg. And the only thing that's different about these eggs in the open bars is those eggs have sat around in the oviduct for a little longer. Essentially, they're kind of deflated eggs. And you know, as anyone here in Baltimore knows, when things are deflated, bad stuff happens. Ah, <laughs> oh, Tom Brady. I just had to get a dig in. <laughs> uh, with our eggs, though, um, thinking about these less rigid than they should be, somewhat deflated eggs, we've done studies here using pharmacological treatments that actually mimic the same effects of post-ovulatory aged eggs. So the names of two drugs are given here. What these drugs do are inhibit enzymes that we know have less activity in an aged egg. So again, this is why I say these, these drug treatments mimic the effects of post-ovulatory aging. What we're looking at here, stained in blue, is the DNA of these eggs. And we have a control treated with the solvent labeled DMSO, and that's over on the left-hand side. And you can see that the DNA is staying very close to the egg surface, right there anchored next to the cortex. And that's what should happen. The middle one is probably the most dramatic and easy to see, and the movie will loop in just a minute, where you can see the DNA actually drifting away from that normal position of being anchored close to the plasma membrane. And this is important for that asymmetric cell division to occur. That's a crucial part of uh, female meiosis and also crucial for reproductive success. So on my next couple slides, I'll give you a little um, presentation of where we see our research with cortical tension going. So this is a little snapshot of some of the uh, studies that we've been doing. Um, one thing that I've utilized is a transcriptome database that includes lots of different tissues. So in the super small font down on the x-axis here are lots of different tissues in the body. And one thing that we've done along the way is try to identify things that maybe aren't exclusively expressed in eggs, but are expressed in eggs at a, a, a relatively high level. And that's what we're showing here in this graph. So the uh, red bars are oocytes and also early embryos, fertilized eggs. And this is a protein that caught our eye exactly because of this particular expression pattern. This is a protein that binds the actin cytoskeleton. The protein is known as Nexalin. And the other tissue that it's relatively enriched in is shown in those green bars, which is skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. So this is um, just a little advertisement for Lauren's talk on Monday. She has been spearheading this entire project. And I'll zoom in now on a specific stage of meiotic maturation for the purposes of highlighting a key stage right here in the middle. I'll point to it right now with the pointer as well as with my mouse pad. A, a key intermediate step is the organization of the meiotic spindle in the middle of the oocyte, and then that spindle moves off to the periphery as illustrated here in the oocyte on the rightmost side. And so what Lauren has found is that oocytes without Nexalin get stuck in this middle stage. And this is significant also for reproductive success. Um, here's a highlight of a review article written by a new collaborator who's actually now here at Hopkins. His name is Jim Seegers in GYNOB, highlighting that oocytes that fail along the way in this process of meiotic maturation are, is an underlying contributing factor to female infertility. And so we actually have a project kicking off with Jim that we're pretty excited to follow up on with regard to these kinds of phenomena. And I will show those on the next couple slides. Also do a little advertisement um, to try to recruit some other collaborators, another great thing about being in the School of Public Health. So Nexalin, as I highlighted a couple slides ago, is also relatively enriched in muscle. And in fact, it's been found that Nexalin mutations contribute to certain types of cardiomyopathies. And that's what's illustrated here in this diagram. This is a dilated left ventricle. This is known as dilated cardiomyopathy. Mutations in Nexalin also contribute to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
So one of our underlying hypotheses that we're interested in pursuing um, with Jim is the concept that potentially patients who display with uh, dilated or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy at the age that notes diseases normally show up, 40s, 50s, 60s, might have had female infertility in their 20s and 30s. So here I will admit to being an epidemiology amateur. The farthest I've I audited uh, Bill Moss's <laughs> class last year, and it was fantastic. I think I could almost talk to an epidemiologist and articulate how we'd like to do these studies. Um, but we're quite interested in either looking at, at patients who have these um, cardiac diseases, or perhaps even who have Nexelin mutations of that subset who have these cardiomyopathies and then be able to look back and see if they might have had female fertility difficulties, with the prediction being that their oocytes would have had some of those same problems that Lauren McGinnis is seeing in our mouse model. <coughs> Here also are some of our papers related to this. I'll highlight um, also the work of um, a couple other groups that have built on our body of work. Um, so a group in France has identified that um, a key window of cortical tension is crucial for the spindle moving to the side of the egg for that asymmetric cell division. And then very recently, a really exciting paper has shown that embryo quality correlates with how hard or how soft an embryo is. And this study was particularly significant because he actually extended beyond the mouse model and were able to do some of these studies with human oocytes. So we're quite excited for you know, having provided some of the foundation here and also to see where the work could go. And then last but not least, I'll draw your attention to this paper um, highlighted um, in the red. This was uh, recently published just in the last couple of months. And here we're focusing on a different protein that goes by the acronym UCHL1. I'll highlight it on the next slide. We think it fits into kind of a similar paradigm as with Nexlin and cardiomyopathies. With the difference being that this particular protein, UCHL1, which stands for ubiquitin C-terminal hydrolase, also has a different name, PARC5, which it means it's implicated in Parkinson's disease. So we also are interested in UCHL1 in a similar fashion, as well as Parkinson's disease patients who might have these mutations, with the same kind of uh, prediction that perhaps female infertility was a predecessor, maybe even a harbinger, for Parkinson's disease later on in life. And just to give a little extra taste of some of the other areas that we're interested in, this is the cover from Time Magazine back in 2010, a very exciting uh, public health relevant area of developmental origins of health disease, how the first nine months shape the, first, the rest of your life. There are other data, though, that indicate that this is, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And actually, there can be periconception origins and even preconception origins that can shape the rest of your life. And this is particularly significant, going back to what I said a little while ago about those germ cells, in the, in the case of the female, um, the, the fetal oocytes, being set aside very early in gestation. In fact, these fetal germ cells, sperm or eggs to be, are set aside in the first trimester. And so what's illustrated here is, in this case, with a mom who's smoking, she's actually exposing three different generations to that cigarette smoke, herself, her fetus, and then also her grandchildren, at least half of her grandchildren, in terms of those fetal germ cells illustrated here set aside in that fetus. And so one of the hypotheses that we're excited about pursuing goes back to thinking about the oocyte in its follicular environment. So the bottom of the slide you've seen before, I illustrated that showing the ovary and the oocyte within its follicle. And noting up in the top half of the slide, now we've got a fetus with a fetal ovary and highlighting how these uh, cells are set aside um, and these follicles then organize at this very early stage. And we're thinking about the oocyte's mechanobiology, its mechanical properties being a way that the oocyte is, as I put it here, literally feeling its environment. And this may be something that then contributes to oocyte quality even later on in life. So with that, I will switch gears. I want to give props to the second half of my title. So I've shown you a little bit of how we unscramble eggs, as I put it. Um, and now onward to the point of hatching new learning experiences. And as I stopped and thought about this, uh, it also occurred to me that's like, hmm, 
we, it, it's still an interest in future generations, just in a different kind of way. The work that I was just showing you, you know, contribute is, is relevant to the health of embryos that result from these eggs along the way. In terms of hatching new learning experiences for students, obviously there we're thinking about the next generation of biomedical scientists, public health practitioners. One other thing also with hatching new learning experiences, I'm still doing experiments, and I'll tell you guys a little bit about one of my new experience, experiments related to teaching here. So with that, I kind of want us to step back and, and think a little bit about our roles as educators. And, and indeed, you know, one of the things that we try to convey to any trainee that works with us is a sense of, of literacy as well as competency to go out in the workplace and, and basically be successful and happy. And indeed, competencies are kind of the cornerstone for a lot of what we talk about in higher education right now. And in fact, when I teach my first term reproductive biology class, I see some people who take that class in the room, they, they know that I, I talk about the course from the standpoint of, of acquiring reproductive biology literacy. And I bring that up with the awareness of, of that room has students who are going to do lots of different things with that information. Some of them are going to go off and work in Planned Parenthood. Some will work in NGOs. Some are in international health interested in women's health. Some are going to go on to medical school. Some are interested in research. But my mission in, in that, that informational-based course is to at least get some reproductive biology literacy, as I put it, um, so that students can then use that in the purposes that suit them moving forward in their careers. But so then, then that takes me kind of the next level of, of thinking. So how do we really get to a point where you can really apply that reproductive biology literacy? Or even, I put the reproductive in brackets, how do you really apply any level of, of <laughs> biology literacy? So, so our classic, you know, in terms of experiential learning in the biomedical sciences has, has focused on research as the cornerstone. And indeed, research is, is one of the key ways of applying what you've learned, you know, that comes out of a classic textbook that then you can actually both, both apply and advance. And of course, it's experiential learning. It's, it's actually doing stuff with your own hands and with your own brain um, in terms of discovering the unknown. And these are two of the trainees in my lab, Lauren's at the top, Pola Olchek's at the bottom. Um, working in the lab, and, you know, and indeed, research is a great experiential learning tool. But, but Lauren and Paul are only a snapshot of the kind of students that we deal with, um, both in biochemistry and molecular biology, and in the school as a whole. So we have a vibrant master's program. Um, this is illustrating uh, the cohort from just a couple years ago. These students take this class. Um, a lot of these people are interested in medicine as a career. Some of them were biology majors, but interested in something else. They, they, they aren't sure they want to go to medicine. They aren't sure about research, yeah, but they're, they're thinking hard about, about you know, what else can they do. And, and these guys would do something different with that reproductive biology literacy. And then we've got other kinds of students here. I singled out Chelsea Polis without even knowing that she was going to be here today giving a talk in, in PFRH. But she's another example. She took my course back in 2005 as a PhD student in epidemiology. So she's very invested in reproductive health. Um, and by the way, anyone who wants to follow a wonderful blog or follow her on Twitter, I highly recommend it. She's, she's a terrific scientist. Um, and she and I are kind of cut from the same mold. I'm very wed to the biological data. She's very wed to the epidemiological data and talks a lot about evidence-based stuff, which I think is just fantastic. Um, but again, it's kind of going to getting that reproductive biology literacy and being able to use it in different ways. And, and here in the Bloomberg School, definitely appreciating that we've got these students with different career paths and different kinds of research orientations. All of this comes together to basically make health better, saving lives millions at a time. So that's what got me thinking as an educator about other types of application and other types of experiential learning. And that's where these two come into play. So this is the source team. Here they are. They are not playing hooky in DC, nor are they um, you know, trying to bother President Obama. They were, they were actually in DC for an Institute of Medicine report related to the framework for educating health professionals, much of what we train here in the School of Public Health, to address social determinants of health. 
And a big reason that they were there representing SOURCE, our Student Outreach Resource Network, was to advocate for a certain type of pedagogy called service learning, which has become you know, kind of the approach that I've been taking in terms of thinking other types of application and experiential learning. And so with that, here I've got an image that you, know, you may call it what you wish, you know, something anonymous without giving it a name. And, and here I'll do a shout out to one of my fellow uh, source service learning, yeah, she, she thinks of a moment where here in a research institution you stand up and say, hi, I'm Janice. Hi, Janice. <laughs> I'm a teacher. <laughs> And so there's Teachers Anonymous of sorts. And, and it is you know, interesting to grapple with, with our dedication to teachers at, at a research intensive institution. So here the acronym is TA. And of course, TA stands for something else, teaching assistant. But one big thing that I've been starting to embrace as an educator is thinking not just about a teaching assistant, but really what would be more accurately called a learning assistant. And, and that's kind of a new way of thinking about education, I think, now in the 21st century. And so as, as Mike noted, um, I did the Source Faculty Fellows Program, which is a way of learning, of learning service learning pedagogy with the purpose of developing a service learning course. And this actually started when Marie Diener West, along with Mindy, did an information session about the practicum experience for MPH students. <laughs> And, and I must say, when, when Mindy gave the first definition of what service learning is, I, I have to say, I, I was intrigued. I was probably hooked very early on. And here are some of the key elements of the service learning definition that I'll highlight for you. So one thing, it's a, it's a structured learning experience combining preparation and reflection. And reflection is the biggie that really spoke to me. We are all so incredibly busy, so stinking busy. We, we just don't have time to stop and think and absorb. And that's what reflection is all about. And the idea of including it in an educational experience really spoke to me. And then certainly in terms of thinking about us here at Hopkins, these other elements of the dish definition were a big deal too. Responding to community identified concerns. So that's this concept of reciprocity, which is a big part of service learning. Thinking about what the community needs or specifically what a community-based organization could benefit from and, and integrating that in a learning experience for students. And indeed, the big picture down at the bottom getting them engaged in their roles as citizens. What could be you know, more important in turning out the next generation? And, and so here we kind of all stop and think, at least I did, about, about Baltimore. We all have some kind of relationship with Baltimore. And, and we have these ties with Hopkins, too. And so the Faculty Fellows Program, for me, was, was just a very interesting way to explore my relationship with Baltimore, and then also the institution's relationship with Baltimore. And indeed, that's an integral part of doing these learning experiences. And I think it's very important to note that, that we should segregate this from, from our classic concepts that we have in academia. Um, the upper right is illustrating an ivory tower. One thing that's incredibly powerful, I think, is getting out of that ivory tower and seeing what's going on in the real world, not to mention to provide trainees an opportunity to see what's going on in the real world, to get out of the nice, tidy world of academia um, and actually work in, in a real world setting. And of course, cultural humility is another big part of, of this experience as well. I'm appreciating we're not knights on white horses riding in, but instead really trying to connect with the community in, in a meaningful way. So I will confess, when I went and did the service learning uh, fellowship, um, I was surrounded by a lot of great other faculty in nursing, public health, and medicine. And you know, that was almost another kind of Alcoholics Anonymous moment of just like, hi, I'm Janice Evans, and I'm in biochemistry and molecular biology. And <laughs> I got a nice laugh from the source crowd because I, yeah, you guys took a risk on me, and I, I do appreciate it. And as I, it was like from the Scorsese short, what's a nice girl like you doing in a place like this? What's someone from biochem and molecular biology doing with service learning? And, but you guys were very supportive. I even remember Andy Timlock going, I can't wait to see what you do. I have no idea what you're going to do but I can't wait to see it. And so here was my different type of experiment. Um, you know, thanks to the help of, um, from the source crew, um, as well as a lot of help from Sarah Hill in, in learning about competencies and developing course descriptions, 
This was the new course that I ran this year, very creatively named, you might now see, Applying Reproductive Biology Literacy Through Service Learning. Indeed, taking that concept from the first term course, you learn the biology, and then you get out in the real world and use it. So with Source's help, this is one thing that they do that's really amazing, is they help connect you with community-based organizations um, that can actually utilize those services, contribute a learning experience, and actually specific projects that students can do um, over the course of a term. So these were three different partners that we worked with this past year. Um, one thing that was particularly enriching um, in having for the team of the class was these were three very different populations. Um, Casa de Maryland has a youth program known as Mi Espacio. Um, so it's primarily supporting um, Hispanic and Latino youth um, around high school age. YO stands for Youth Opportunity Baltimore. Um, that's primarily targeting African American young people, 17 to maybe 24, who probably have not finished high school, who are working on um, developing um, either skills to pass the GED, job getting skills, et cetera. And then the third one was CASE, which stands for Community Adolescent Sex Education. So these were individuals who go out and volunteer to teach sex education in middle schools. So that's not supported by tax dollars here in Baltimore City. Um, and so this is a Hopkins-based organization, all student run. <clears throat> And, and so here's some shots just of the class. And this was a particularly meaningful class when we have the officials from the community-based organizations come and talk with the students. Um, and so they were absolutely amazing. And, and one thing that's really cool about this experience is it, it, you'll note I'm not even here, and it's not just because I'm the one taking the pictures. I'm really not the teacher here. The people in the community-based organizations are doing just as much of the teaching, just as much as contributing to the learning experience. Um, and likewise, the students were similarly teaching me. So one thing that was quite remarkable here was, was the blurring of that teacher to learning experience, learner experience. And, and all of us having those different roles at different times through the course of the academic term. In fact, I would say I learned just as much as you know, maybe the students did, if not more. And, and so just to give a little bit of the student perspective, I apologize for the long slide, but I'll just highlight some of the things here. Uh, about an eagerness to, to go out and work with the Hispanic youth in Mia Espacio, nervous to try the Spanish, um, but then bigger picture going, there was an impact this course had on me that I didn't fully expect. And it all resonates with, around that theme of, of developing these skills, of, of working out in the real world, dealing with feelings of, of, of discomfort, having to be resilient and, and work with the community members, um, and then also tying that very directly with, with population health work. Also significantly continuing um, a related quote um, showing that we're getting this you know, nice practical education in, in the Bloomberg School of Public Health, but it's really worth getting out in, as we call it fondly in, our, in, in service learning, the swamp. Messy human issues and a real world application and this higher ground education that's happening in classrooms right here around us, going out and applying them in the real world, in the swamp, so to speak, is, is, is really making a complete education. And so I thank, thank my students who, who gave me these incredible insights. So I, I've been very lucky. I see CTL people here. Thank you, guys. Um, it's been a great deal of fun working with folks from CTL. And they will show you dazzling data like these. Um, so this is the enrollment in MOOCs. Um, so down on the x-axis are months and years, the y-axis are numbers, 4 million plus students taking these MOOCs, and this, this is truly dazzling. I cannot claim that as of yet with regard to service learning, but I did have an amazing eight weeks with amazing, eight, eight amazing young women who took this class, and I'd like to think that this will make an impact down the road and also can, can add a lot to thinking about how we can train um, students that come through our doors here at the school. So with that, I'll go back to the slide that I started with. And here I did play a little trick on you. I talked about how in reflection is so important when I first showed the slide and I said, look at this. Think about those pregnancy tests. And I sounded like a psychologist. How does that make you feel? That was making you reflect, making you kind of check in with a gut reaction to looking at this. So with that, I have to say just a few more things. 
This is a long list of, again, the researchers that have been in the lab. I sure hope I got everybody. Um, my three current lab members in the bright yellow. Wonderful collaborators. Doug, you're the best. <laughs> um, and others, um, and certainly funding agencies. I am very, very lucky um, to be with NICHD. They have some of the best program officers in the world. So also, the school has been amazing. I've listed a you know, number of different things that have been important to me here. The department, Center for Teaching and Learning, Source, you rock, and the students you know, who I get to see year after year, you make this a very special place to be. With that, I am closing with gratitude. Namaste, y'all. <laughs> Thanks for a great talk, and uh, it was really wonderful to see a faculty member from a laboratory-based department talk about service learning. So I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. Uh, just one thing, I may have missed it, uh, but you know, the, the egg, just to, about the first part of your talk, the egg you know, gets softer yep. you know, as it ages. And there's actin uh, you know, that's holding the egg you know, taut. Yep, got it. Relaxation is usually uh, is energy dependent. And so I would think that as the egg ages, there might be less energy sources, it would get more tense. So what's ah. the mechanism for that softening? We know a bit of the mechanism, although not from the energetic standpoint. <laughs> um, but, but to go to part of your question, you're, you're spot on with thinking about energetics because we know there is mitochondrial dysfunction with mm -hmm. post-ovulatory mm -hmm. aging. So although we haven't explored it, you're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. that, that could be part of the underlying mechanism here. But, but it should get stiffer then. Right? You would think it gets stiffer. Because, the other contributor yeah, yeah. Um, were some of those enzymes that I hinted at while showing that live yeah. cell imaging. So we know yeah. post-ovulatory aged eggs have certain um, enzymatic activities right. that are reduced. MAP kinase and those other You got yeah, it, yeah. yeah. And, and those, those are the ones that are declining in post-ovulatory yeah. aged eggs. Also, when we mimic that yeah. and by inhibiting those, one of those also is myosin light chain kinase. Right. So that's the kinase that phosphorylates the regulatory light chain of mm -hmm. myosin. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that phosphorylation is what activates that regulatory light chain. So without that activation, that, that myosin-based contractility is actually reduced. So we, we're, we're pretty sure that's part of the mechanism contributing to that relaxation mm. with, with aging. But yeah, you're absolutely right. There could be more, and there probably is a good bit more yeah. going on. There's a lot of abnormalities in aged eggs. Right, right. No, good. So, uh, so if uh, people want to make comments or questions, please use the microphone because this is being taped and we want to be able to podcast it. So, mics here and there. Stan. Thank you. Very nice. Um, you showed the woman smoking. How would you do studies to show the effects two generations down? Uh, what would you look for and what might you expect? Thank you. Yeah, no, that, that's, that is an incredibly hot area in reproduction right now is reproductive toxicology, as well as this concept of transgenerational effects. So one of the best approaches is doing it in an animal model, especially with a short lifespan and short gestational time. Um, so rats, mice are commonly used, although people are using larger animals. And in fact, large farm animals are you know, one of the places where, where some of the longitudinal data are, are, are available. What, what we would like to do um, with our specific hypothesis that the mechanics of the oocyte cortex are going to be important for that oocyte developing the capacity to be a healthy oocyte, namely developing um, the capacity for embryonic development would be to create a mouse model where we've disrupted some of the molecular machinery that we know regulates cortical tension. Um, allow those mice to reproduce. Um, look at the reproductive outcomes. Also, it would be worthwhile to look at those oocytes and do a transcriptome-based type approach, such as RNA-seq, and ascertain if, what their transcriptome profile looks like relative to uh, a wild type, a control oocyte that has its normal sensing of its environment. Our experimental prediction would be that we would see a different transcriptome profile <clears throat> in this particular case, and potentially that could link in turn with chromatin organization in the nucleus. This goes to a hot area in mechanobiology, namely that the cortical cytoskeleton can affect organization of DNA within the nucleus, which in turn can impact which regions of chromatin are active and which ones are inactive. Um, so we could also potentially do approaches where we could look at chromatin organization in the nucleus as well as an add-on there. 
Thank you, Jim. Gross. Beautiful talk. Um, you talked about the post-ovulatory aging, which, you know, in your mouse studies was occurring on the order of magnitude of hours. Right. But there are also an increase in the probability of fertility problems as women age. And so are there changes in this cortical tension that are maybe at least contributing, if not causing, to the increased the increased probability and fertility problems with age and women. You you are psychic, as I like to say. You get psychic points. That's one of our dream experiments is okay. is to look at chronologically yeah. aged eggs. So eggs from aged animals, yeah. um, rather than you know the the aging, more cellular-based aging. Mm -hmm. We haven't been able to do that, but it, it is very much on the wish list. Getting aged mice. You know, you're yeah. paying somebody to keep those mice around for a while, and then you, or, or you, you buy them and you keep them around yourself. Mm -hmm. We just haven't been able to tackle that yet, but, but yeah, it is a great question, and yeah, we would be eager to do that. And so then, fertility treatments that women may get if they are having fertility problems, does that order? alter this cortical tension? Yeah, that, that too is a good question. And so here we can think of this on many different levels. You can think about it on the physiological level, for example, if they're getting gonadotropin mm -hmm. stimulation mm -hmm. for, to, to stimulate um, uh, production of eggs, right. more follicles, and hopefully more eggs being ovulated from those follicles. Yeah, that, that's one variation. I, I will disclose, Sam, the eggs that we've studied are from a mice that have received exogenous gonadotropins. We have okay. not yet looked at, at naturally cycling, cycling females, mm -hmm. but it, it is a very good question, and we do know there's some differences between those oocytes. <laughs> the other are doing these in vitro manipulations, mm -hmm. whether it's doing a technique where you inject the sperm into the mm -hmm. egg, known as intracytoplasmic sperm injection. We haven't done assays of cortical tension on those, but I would not be surprised if mm -hmm. there are some differences, and we can talk about it over wine, but some of the other analyses mm -hmm. that we've done, um, looking at other parts of oocyte biology, I would predict that their mechanics are different too. So I, I do hope yeah. that we're, we're, we're onto something yeah, here. Yeah, applications. That, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So, uh, at the mic and then Jim. Uh. Yeah, I, I can. I just have a quick question about um, the aging of the oocyte. If with increasing age, there's a, I think, you know, an increased probability of that oocyte not functioning very well, why is it that people are not going to, like, freezing their eggs while they can and then use them later in life? And, like, what are your... I what are my thoughts freezing. on OSI cryopreservation? Oh, yeah. yeah, so yeah. What, what are your thoughts Oh, yeah, about and that? then this, uh, probably every student who sits in my fundamentals of reproductive biology class, because this is getting more and more and more headlines. Um, it, it has recently been deemed not an experimental procedure, which, which is you know, essentially an upgrade in the clinical space in terms of women being able to use this. It is expensive. I don't think insurance covers it. Um, and meanwhile, we have no long-term data on the freezing of these mature oocytes and what the reproductive outcomes from those would be. We have done freezing of embryos for a long time. Um, embryos are much easier to freeze. Sperm, of course, are easier to freeze. So there's, there's lots of data from animal models, and both from lab animals and from uh, agriculturally relevant species with regard to those but not with oocyte freezing. So there, the scientist in me and the, the, the worries, you know, that we're not just treating a woman's desire to wait to have kids. The impact of this is on a next generation, on the kid that she's gonna produce. And so while I acknowledge a woman's right to choose that option, there is a part of me that goes, we just don't have data. Now here I'll sound like Chelsea did earlier, we just don't have data on what the outcomes are when you take a mature oocyte, take it through freezing, and then thought years later, get sperm in it, put it back in her uterus, and when we have those data, maybe I'll be able to give you a an better answer, but that, we are talking decades there if we're talking about humans. Great talk, Janice. Thank you, Jim. Changing system. Has any of this kind of mechanical um, mechan uh, mechanism been looked at as cells become invasive in cancer or malignant? Doug Robinson, would you like to answer that? <laughs> well, you might have. So my collaborator Doug is right behind you, and he's done studies like this, primarily in pancreatic cancer. Yes. Oh, okay. 
I was wondering if there's that kind of change as cells begin, you know, to be invasive. So you know, I would say v versus just you know being in a tumor yeah. and then it's just getting that next stage right. where they become invasive. Are they are their membranes becoming more flaccid? So Jim, if you could hand Doug the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, that's but that's right. what you get for showing up. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, the, the I guess the answer is the field is sort of starting to appreciate that mechanical changes is almost a universal truth. It's not categorical, of course, there's some exceptions to that. Even when you're talking about tumor cells in the, in the context of their home tumor, um, there are often associated mechanical changes at that point. And I would say the numbers are something like eight, 70 to 80 percent at least of known tumor cells after they leave the parent tumor are more deformable just as Janice is talking about. And actually, just to add one extra little plug on that, we're starting to appreciate there's a whole change in specific set of proteins, not unlike the ones that James has already talked about, that are upregulated, probably promoting that, and are directly responsible for how the cells are going to respond to mechanical forces and so forth. Yeah, so some of the take home message from that very insightful question is, this does have broad applicability. And I think, you know, both Doug and I are very passionate about this being, you know, a, a, a significant burgeoning area that, that's been studied for decades. Some of the first eggs that were studied for their mechanical properties was back in the 1930s, people squishing them between plates and noticing that it took different squishing pressure. And now it's really coming into a hotbed with the combination of biophysical approaches and quantitative cell biology to really appreciate what these features are. So I think it'll apply in many places. Great. Well, okay. So last question. Okay. Yeah. Oh my gosh, your leadership seminar feed. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Thanks, Janice. What an exciting talk. I'm just curious about the interaction between the mechanical and the biochemical um, influences, right? So suppose the ion channels open and release stuff from the cell and there's like a different hydraulic pressure happening, like wouldn't that also have a deflationary effect? And, it, you know, is that part of, I mean, I mean, so there's that happening, but like is there interaction between the, um, the mechanical forces on the cortical tension and, and the other uh, influences? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer your question with yet another plug for Lauren McGinnis's doctoral dissertation and highlight a little bit of her data. Um, where she's done experiments um, related to the ion channel question, we haven't identified the exact ion channel at this point. But in studies that she's done of um, doing these mechanical uh, experimental perturbations that, that result in aberrant cortical tension, when we've looked at certain um, pathways regulated by ions, specifically calcium and zinc, we see that these are dysregulated. And we think quite possibly it is due to that softer cortex allowing channels to function inappropriately, most likely open inappropriately. And a set of her data point to uh, specifically an influx of calcium ions from the extracellular space to the intracellular space. And you're spot on. This, this absolutely changes the biochemistry within the oocyte cytosol. And specifically, what that does is allow the egg to activate, to finish meiotic division when it shouldn't. You know, in other words, it normally should only do that if a sperm comes along. And it's doing this inappropriately. Um, in these particular instances. And indeed, it's been known for a long time that spontaneous activation occurs in these post ovulatory aged eggs. So now, thanks to her data, we're getting at some of the mechanism for how that inappropriate activation is occurring. Good question. Well, uh, so first I want to thank everybody for coming and participating. And uh, I want to thank you for an incredibly articulate and insightful talk that obviously stimulated all of us. And so let's, uh, let's thank Janice for the talk. And uh, we can continue the conversation out uh, in the gallery.